So welcome back, everyone. It's always great to see everybody return after the lunch break. I thought I would let you know I did have an opportunity throughout the discussion this morning to pop around from room to room, and I also had a sneak peek at some of the theming that was happening in each room and get a chance to get some early indications of the ideas and conversations that were happening. I will say you were very busy this morning. There were many, many great ideas that were generated. As I mentioned this morning, in addition to the report back that you would have just heard in your uh, room that you attended, all of that information as well as the information from the other rooms will be posted on the Way Forward website today. Um, we have some teams upstairs just putting it in the appropriate formatting, so all of that will be made publicly available. And we'll be doing a more broader summary roll-up report uh, at the end of the session later on this afternoon. But I wanted to thank you all for willingly engaging in the conversation. Um, all of your room facilitators were very pleased with how willingly and freely everyone was sharing their ideas and lots of great conversation. So thank you all for doing that, and we look forward to continuing that now in the afternoon session. Uh, one little, um, I guess, piece of advice that I would give you, now you've had a chance to get to know the people in your discussion group, you've started to maybe understand their perspectives, don't be afraid to move a little bit more away from your stakeholder hat. Not to diminish that perspective that you bring, because that's highly valuable, but I think some of the real rich discussion happens when we're able to look at things in a more collaborative manner. So don't feel shy about doing that, and I know some people actually had asked that question if that was appropriate. So. Um, so I am now going to invite Premier Ball back to the podium to deliver our remarks and introduce the afternoon portion. Premier Ball. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Michelle. And Michelle is right. As uh, we mentioned, we were just having a little side chat over there a few minutes ago. You've been invited here primarily because you have a certain amount of expertise in the, in the fields that you represent for many of you. But let's not forget that we all are consumers of government services, we use our healthcare services, we use the educational services and so on. So even though you come with the unique experience that you would have within your own industries, you're also very importantly consumers of government services as well. And you also pay taxes. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, for an afternoon session called Realizing Our Potential. Our initiatives under the Realizing Our Potential theme are focused on addressing trends, that will have a negative impact on economic growth and drive up government expenditures. As I mentioned before, all the initiatives that we present today are designed to achieve meaningful, positive change without driving costs. At the outset, I want to remind everyone that we cannot cover everything in one day. Our intention is to give you, as I mentioned this morning, the general sense of the overall approach and position you to be able to provide feedback on that approach. I am joined by ministers who lead departments that are vital to achieving our goals in this regard. So far today, we've explored ways to move toward fiscal balance and build economic strength. These are important objectives, but they cannot be the only considerations when we look at the future. We also need to focus on achieving better outcomes for the people of our province. The incidence of obesity and chronic disease are higher in Newfoundland and Labrador than they are anywhere else in the, re in the rest of Canada. Our immigration levels continue to lag behind our Atlantic provinces. We have fewer people with high school diplomas and university degrees than the Canadian average. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have an outcome problem. The good folks working in the community-based organizations throughout our province know, they know this firsthand because they see it every day when working with some of the most vulnerable populations in our society. Employers appreciate this because it impacts the human resources that they have available to them. Healthcare professionals know this from the experience because they see how it puts extra strain on the provincial health care system. Our government appreciates the impact of our outcomes problem because it drives expenses. Our outcomes problem is preventing us from reaching our potential. That is why we are committing a full afternoon this session today to discuss our plans to improve those outcomes. Yes, we appreciate the financial realities of our province and we are committed to restoring fiscal prudence in the coming years. But while our decisions 
must be focused on reducing and overall spending, our decision must also be rooted on the principle of improving outcomes. The two concepts, they go hand in hand. If your population is unwell, your health care costs are higher, and balancing the books becomes that much more difficult. For an example of this, I want to direct your attention to the next slide. Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest per capita spending on health care than any other Canadian province. Specifically, our province spends $5,200 per person on health care, and if you compare that to the Canadian average of just over 4000 On an interesting note, from a personal consumption point of view, no one in this room would know how much your government would pay for health care on your behalf. But I gave you those numbers. What they mean is that we are spending around 28% more per capita than all provinces and territories combined. This trend has been in place for some time now, and it is not sustainable. We have to find solutions to this. Clearly, poor health outcomes are a major cost driver in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we need to change that. So we are committed to turning the tide on this and other negative trends. You will see that in the initiatives that we present to you for consideration this afternoon. To start the discussion, I will now turn the proceedings over to Dr. John Agee, who is our Minister of Health and Community Service. Thank you, Premier Ball. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I speak to uh, some of the initiatives, a snapshot of initiatives that our government will pursue to achieve better and more responsive health services, I want to give you a better sense of what we're up against in terms of poor indicators. People in our province smoke more than the national average. They drink more than the national average. They eat less healthy foods than the national average. And as a result, they experience chronic disease more than the national average. There are many issues that are created by this, but the one I will focus on for the purpose of discussion today is how these risk factors affect the volume of people going to hospitals. We need to reduce the pressure on emergency rooms throughout the province. Doing so will positively affect the level of the service we can provide to people who need it. Further to the Premier's opening comments this morning, our government will help address this issue by improving access to primary health care in the community. And we're going to do this by establishing more multidisciplinary health teams to serve specific regions of the province. These teams are comprised of doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, and other health professionals. They're specially arranged to meet the specific needs of the individual region and they will ensure that people throughout the province, in the end, will have timely access to health care. We've already established two such teams in the province and seen great results. One was set up in St. John's in partnership with The Gathering Place. It's very successful because it's actually tailored to serve the needs of the individuals who actually avail of the services in that area. Research shows that health systems with a strong foundation in this model are the most effective in terms of achieving positive outcomes. They're also the most economically sustainable. Furthermore, there's evidence that this approach improves health outcomes, increases patient satisfaction, and reduces turnover. The model has been particularly successful meeting the needs of people with chronic disease, seniors, and vulnerable populations. Local health professional groups, academics, and the regional health authorities have told us this approach will be essential to improve outcomes, and we're responding to that feedback. So work on expanding this initiative will begin next year when we're going to add two new teams uh, in Cornerbrook and in Burin. As I'm speaking about meeting pressing health needs head on, I also want to speak about the recommendations that will come 
from the All-Party Committee on Mental Health and Addictions. Our government appreciates the need to transform the way mental health and addiction services are delivered in our province. We will be prepared to respond immediately to the recommendations of the All-Party Committee when that report is received in November. Our response will include an appropriate redesign of the mental health and addiction system to ensure it meets the needs of individuals who rely upon it. And there'll be two key performance indicators that we're gonna hold ourselves to. Firstly, we're gonna look at reports from clients about their access to mental health and addiction services and the ease with which they navigate the system. And secondly, decrease in wait times for mental health and addiction services. So these are just two initiatives our government plans to pursue to enhance health supports, but they do give a sense of how we're prioritizing and addressing those needs. The discussion is now going to move towards the financial support programs our government provides to protect the well-being of vulnerable populations. And to lead that discussion, I'm going to turn the discussion over now to my colleague, the Honorable Sherry Gambon Walsh, Minister of Children, Seniors, and Social Development. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Hagee. Good afternoon, everyone. I am here today to discuss some unique approaches to providing funding that should result in better outcomes for the people we serve. First, I want to speak about the expansion of a program that was introduced recently to promote better health outcomes for children. Our government will expand the Healthy School Planner Initiative. This is a free online tool that allows a school to assess its school health environment and identify areas for improvement. It also provides tools and resources to develop an action plan to address identified gaps. As an example of how this has worked so far, our government partnered with 52 schools to complete the module related to physical activity. We supported these schools with a small investment of a few thousand dollars each so they could take action on improvements recommended by the program. With that small investment, schools were able to purchase accessible playground equipment, sports equipment, and even establish bike clubs to help kids get active and fit. Our government will continue to help the first 52 schools complete other modules, such as, such as healthy eating and positive mental health. We will also expand this initiative so that up to 50 additional schools can participate in 2017. Addressing the gaps identified through the Healthy School Planner will improve students' health, which is directly linked to educational outcomes. The program represents one way we will promote healthy school environments, which in turn will help students succeed academically and prepare our youth to make healthy choices as adults. I will now speak to our plans to introduce a brand new, individualized support funding model. Under our current approach to providing funding, individuals with complex needs may have to access funding supports from multiple departments of government. Using the standard approach, this funding model is very prescriptive. The recipient has little personal input over what supports they can speak out. As part of the Empowering the People Seeking Supports, our government will implement an individualized support funding module. This approach has been found to be very successful in other jurisdictions. I'll give an example. A senior with a mobility disability may receive a specific amount of funding for home support. Under a traditional funding model, government is very prescriptive about how the funding must be used. Only certain supports can be purchased according to the program rules. Under the new individualized support funding model, we will implement that person would receive funding, but would have increased personal choice over directing a portion of it towards home care, a portion towards transportation, and a portion of it towards assistive devices. All services provided must be in keeping with an individual support plan. You see, a key aspect of the approach is that it makes individuals active participants in decision making by giving them control over the funding they have available to seek supports. 
This funding can be used to arrange personalized services that are responsive to their identified needs and that fit with their daily lives. This counters negative outcomes for people by promoting their independence and better targeting their needs. We expect seniors and persons with disabilities will benefit significantly from this kind of delivery model. I am pleased to note our government will begin implementing the new funding delivery model in 2018. Having discussed a new approach for providing funding for individuals, I will now move the discussion toward funding for community-based organizations. Under current practice, there are instances where community-based organizations in our province have to go to multiple government departments to access the core and program funding they need. To correct this problem, we will create one access point within government that community-based organizations can use to access multi-year operational funding grant agreements. Community-based organizations will benefit from improved stability of funding agreements, the ability to interact with government through one window, and access to consistent funding guidelines, applications, and contracts. It will allow organizations to take on meaningful initiatives that span more than a year and provide stability of staffing as well as funding. These groups do tremendous work in the community, and so our focus will be to make their interactions with us easier so they can stay focused on their important work. We will have this initiative in place in 2018. We recognize there are many other opportunities for our government to support the not-for-profit sector. In all regions of this province, there are many not-for-profit organizations involved in business activity. These social enterprises range from small to large to multi-million dollar operations and are active in a range of sectors such as tourism, fishery, home care, and social housing. I want to acknowledge the work Minister Mitchell Moore will advance in the coming weeks. He will begin engaging various community organizations and other partners in developing a social enterprise action plan for this province. We will work with partners to explore education and training for business skills enhancement, research and opportunity identification, policy development, financing and promotion and awareness. Having provided some examples of ways we will help address the needs of vulnerable populations, I will now turn the proceedings back to Premier Ball. I look forward to speaking to you about the initiatives that I have presented on during the breakout sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Gammon Walsh. So thus far, the discussion is focused on health, the health initiatives aimed at improving health-related outcomes. I want to move on now to speaking about education outcomes. This is an issue that I take very seriously. I want to improve our provincial outcomes in this area, so I initiated a task force to examine the kindergarten to grade 12 education system and to recommend improvements. I will now call on the Honorable Dale Kirby, the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development, to explore and fur to explore further with you and to discuss our government's plans to address the situation. Mr. Kirby. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Premier Ball. Being an educator myself, I joined Premier Ball in wanting to achieve the best educational outcomes possible for our children. To help inform our discussion of educational outcomes in the province, let's take a look at this next slide. I'll let people have a minute to digest it. Here we have uh, comparisons of academic performance by grade eight students throughout the country. Looking at this slide, it's important to note that while uh, some of the information um, it appears as ranking uh, where Newfoundland and Labrador stands in relation to the other provinces. The difference in scoring between the provinces is actually very small. People be familiar with the term uh, plus or minus whatever percent, 19 times out of 20. Sometimes these scores are within the margin of error, if you will. Uh, for example, if you look at the reading outcomes on the 
left-hand side, uh, Ontario is performing significantly better than the other provinces in absolute scoring terms. And our province appears in the middle of the pack. It should be noted, however, that uh, the scoring is very close between second place, which is held by Quebec, and fifth place, held by Newfoundland Labrador. Moving on over to the center column in mathematics, Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta perform significantly better than other jurisdictions in the country. Newfoundland and Labrador ranks eighth in absolute terms. Now the scoring of the middle grouping, which includes, as you can see there, Prince Edward Island, BC, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland and Labrador, this middle group performs significantly better as compared to New Brunswick and Manitoba. Um, essentially, uh, our students are in the mid-range when it comes to performance outcomes in mathematics. In science outcomes on the uh, rightmost column there, um, our province is doing fairly well. Uh, but it's still not at the top of the list, and that is our focus as a government. We're committed to changing these outcomes so that our province moves to the top as compared to the rest of the country in terms of academic outcomes and performance. The future for our youth in Newfoundland and Labrador very much depends on the quality of their education which is why government is going to review curriculum through the task force to see where improvements and necessary changes can be made. The Premier's Task Force on Improving Educational Outcomes is one of the most important initiatives that will be undertaken by our government. We will act on the task force's recommendations to develop a comprehensive education action plan to better engage students in learning and foster the development of skills and competencies. One of the most important aspects of this task force is that ultimately it will ensure another degree of accountability of the education system to the public through the development of measurable educational goals. Some of the key areas that the task force will review include early learning, mathematics, reading, inclusive education, student mental health and wellness, multicultural education, cooperative education, and teacher education and professional development. The task force will provide recommendations to government in 2017, and we will begin implementing actions in schools in the 2018 school year. And I look forward to pursuing this work uh, with the Premier and updating you and the public as we make a progress along the way. Another initiative that I will highlight here regarding education is our effort to increase revenue generated from international education activity. And frequently when I run into colleagues across the country, whether it's from my previous work as an academic or uh, people who I went to university with, I frequently hear of people who've traveled to Asia and to the Middle East, why aren't we more present when it comes to the use of our curriculum versus other provinces in Canada? And what we're talking about here could include selling or licensing the use of the province's K-12 education curriculum to other jurisdictions around the world, developing e-learning education services uh, for access by international students, or increasing the number of international students studying in our K-12 education system here in Newfoundland and Labrador. We will pursue revenue generating activity as opportunities are determined as we move forward. Our efforts not only will enhance outcomes for our own youth, but also help address our fiscal needs as well. Um, and I'll hand things over to my colleague uh, the Honorable Jerry Byrne, Minister of Advanced Education, Skills, and Labor, and he was commenting to me earlier that this is much like a Christmas concert, and I also noted that he made a lot more changes to the notes he was provided than I did, so I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Thank you very much.
he is for. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, uh, Minister Dale. Thank you, Premier. And thank you to each and every one of you for your time and your attention, and, but as well your enthusiasm. Um, Premier highlighted that education is a core, a very, very strong pillar to our way forward. I would be tempted to speak a little bit about some of the work that I do, recognizing so many people in this room that I've worked with in terms of income and program support for people who are most vulnerable, working with trade apprenticeships, post-secondary education and its outcomes, immigration and multiculturalism, labor standards and supports, youth employment programs, and among other priorities. But I really do want to pick up on what Minister Kirby was saying, and in particular what the Premier was saying. Specifically, I want to begin uh, by building upon Minister Kirby's own comments and the Premier's, and talk a little bit about two pillars of our provincial fabric, which are Memorial University of Newfoundland and the College of the North Atlantic. Specifically, I want to talk about our government's intention to foster increased collaboration between the university and the college. We have a lot to be very proud of with these two institutions. Supporting economic and labor market growth requires coordination and collaboration. Coordination and collaboration between our government and the province's two public post-secondary institutions. As part of the way forward, our government will work with the university and the college to identify ways for them to collaborate, to partner, and to pool resources in applied research areas and other areas of common interests. Work is already underway in this regard to assist in enhancing agreements between MUN and CNA to support student academic credit transfers between the two institutions. And just last Thursday, I attended a memorial convocation uh, in Cornerbrook at Granville Campus where members of the business, uh, the BBA program, had actually begun their academic careers at CNA and had articulated those programs into Memorial University of Newfoundland. So now to help achieve these particular goals, we will form an advisory council consisting of representatives from government, the university and the college to provide an ongoing forum for joint planning and coordination between the university and the college and the government. In these ways, we will foster more opportunities to direct the expertise of both institutions as appropriate towards addressing the research and labor market, market needs of our province. We have big plans involving the College of the North, the North Atlantic in particular. So moving directly to a conversation about CNA, our government believes in the network of 17 campuses the province holds that have significant potential. For example, it's extremely clear in my mind that each of these campuses uh, could serve as centers for entrepreneurship, for innovation, for research and development, community access, and capacity building. Each is located in some of the province's regional hubs where more of this type of work and this type of initiative needs to occur. Our government will enhance the college's ability to serve as local and regional economic generators and community hubs by creating CNA centers of excellence in key academic and research programs, by utilizing campuses to support increased economic development, not only by fostering research and development and innovation, but by unlocking CNA to serve as centers for entrepreneurship, employment assistance, career counseling, and adult lifelong learning. And we will enhance the use of CNA campus and campus resources with an increased emphasis on community outreach such as open learning and public access. Recreating a vibrant CNA is among our government's top goals with the whole being larger than the simple sum of its individual parts. Having provided detail about creating even more opportunity at the university and college level, I want now to move to something the Premier has already spoken of, to speak positively about addressing two key provincial indicators, population status and availability of certain labor market skills are key issues facing our province. As noted by the Premier in his opening comments today, 
immigration can play an important role in supporting economic and labor market growth, and it contributes to the social and cultural vibrancy of our entire province. As you can see by the upcoming graphic, Newfoundland and Labrador's immigration numbers do indeed lag behind those of New Brunswick, of Nova Scotia, and even PEI with its relatively much smaller domestic or local population. Our government is determined to change that trend. Through a combination of promotional efforts and cooperation with partners that are in this room, partners at the federal and local level, our government will increase the number of immigrants coming to the province. Our goal is to welcome 1,600 immigrants to Newfoundland and Labrador annually by 2022. I very much look forward to delivering on that commitment with each and every one of you. Our government will keep the public informed as we make progress. I'll now call upon my colleague, my friend, the Honorable Perry Trimper, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, to speak to his initiatives within his portfolio. Good afternoon, bon après midi, tout le monde. Thank you, Minister Jerry Byrne. So I guess in the spirit of, uh, of the Christmas pageant, my C for Christmas is gonna be about climate change. <laughs> so our government recognizes that it is essential to make headway on this very challenging but critically important issue of climate change. As part of that, we are committed to reducing greenhouse gas emission levels. By 2020, just four years from now, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 10% below what they were in 1990. This is a very challenging goal, one that's gonna require more action, but we are committed to striving for it and closing what we know as the gap. Given the significance of this issue, our government held public consultations over the summer to hear from Newfoundlanders and Labradorians on three themes. The first, how can we reduce emissions and grow the green economy? Heard a little bit about that this morning. How can our province better adapt to the effects of climate change and improve its resilience? And finally, how can government be a leader in the fight against climate change? What we heard during public and targeted industry and stakeholder consultations just this past summer will help us inform new climate change initiatives. These initiatives will help ensure our government continues to play its role in addressing this very important problem. I appreciate our time is limited, but as we are discussing the environment, I want to take a moment to briefly discuss the Muskrat Falls project and acknowledge the presence of President Lamp here. We certainly understand the concerns related and relating to methylmercury. This is a very important issue that has the full attention of our government for many months, and in fact, it's had our attention of this government since day one. The meeting our government held with the Nunatsiavut government in September to discuss this very important issue was productive. We agreed that an immediate priority was to establish enhanced, advanced water quality monitoring procedures those that will go far beyond what our traditional monitoring approach would be. This, these additional steps will, will provide important information uh, as the initial phase of flooding begins, information that together with the monitoring in fish and seal will ensure we are positioned to protect the health of those who consume this important food source that we in Labrador know as country food. The Department of Environment and Climate Change began work on this monitoring program immediately, and experts within the department have been working collaboratively with the Nunatsiavut government on the design of this program. Just last Friday, on Friday, uh, October 7th, our government met again with President Lamp and his staff and officials, and we discussed our progress to date and our next steps. Our government is committed to exploring a role as well for the Inu Nation and the Nunatukavut Community Council, in addition to the Nunatsiavut government with regards to how this work will proceed. This would include 
the potential for what we refer to as an independent expert advisory committee on which all would participate. Our government remains committed to following the science and to continuing to work with stakeholders on this very important matter. The focus of the rest of my comments today will be a little different from what you have heard from other ministers thus far. My remaining comments will be on our government's plans to enhance the services you receive from the provincial government. Our government is committed to providing the, the highest caliber of service possible for residents throughout the province. We have several initiatives aimed at doing that without increasing costs. The very first initiative I will speak about is our government's efforts to simplify access to services. This will include providing more convenient ways for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to access government services, including enhancements to province-wide community-based government service locations and service sites, and secondly, to establish a single 1-800 telephone number to, to simplify access to all government services. These are immediate goals, but a more ambitious goal will be to implement what we call a digital by design model. Under this service model, citizens will have access to fast, simple, and secure 24-7 online information and transaction services through their computers and phones. This will encourage citizens' use of online technology as an initial service access entry point and make government services easier to access than ever before. You have already seen signs of our government moving in this direction with the implementation of an online driver's license renewal system. You will also see continued efforts like this at the Motor, Re Motor Registration Division and in other lines of business in the years to come. The goal for full implementation of our digital by design approach is 2022. An even bigger initiative that we have planned to enhance provincial government services is the establishment of service standards. Our government understands that we play a vital role in the lives of everyone who avails of our programs and services. However, we are also aware from the feedback we receive that government's decision-making processes often do not keep up with the pace expected by our clients. In an effort to fix that, we are going to review our approval process for government services to determine areas for improvement, including application of lean principles. Our goal is to develop a service standard commitment for making decisions that we can share with the public so there is a, a common and accepted understanding of how long an approval process will take. This will provide a degree of certainty, and that's a word I heard a lot about this morning, to our staff and will certainly improve our communication again with our clients. I'm excited about these enhancements we intend to make and in the delivery of government services. I look forward to speaking with you about this during the breakout session. I will now hand the proceedings over to the Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Trimper, and to all the ministers who presented today. Over the course of our discussion this afternoon, we have talked about specific aspects of provincial government's approach to, moving, to improving various outcomes from multiple mm -hmm. angles. Now the time has come for you to provide your feedback. In a moment, we will go to the breakout rooms to discuss the merits of the ideas that have been presented. You will also be given an opportunity to raise anything that you feel that we have missed. Discussion will be guided by the documents that you have been given, and you will be assisted by the facilitators in the room. So I encourage you to participate fully and share your unique perspectives on all the ideas that we have presented today. Your thoughts will help shape the decisions made by our government in years to come. So S stands for stop the talk, politicians, and let's get into those rooms and have a good, broad discussion. <laughs> so see you in the rooms. <laughs>